say we'll start with this. We'll label Sanchez on Gassiev. I want him to face Andy Ruiz, Adam Kovnowski, or Robert Hellenius. He was quoted as saying he was killing himself to make the way for Cruiserweight. That's not an excuse. Usyk was the better man on the night. We look forward to meeting Usyk at heavyweight, Sanchez told Sky Sports. I first started working with him when he was nearly 20 years old. He was 192 pounds back then. I saw his frame and his hands. He has tremendously big hands. I said, this young man will dominate the Cruiserweight ranks, then become a very good heavyweight. It took a little longer to get to the heavyweights, but he will be good. I anticipated this when I first started working with him. His hands told me everything. He's as big a puncher as the best heavyweights. Sanchez believes Gassiev, due to his power, will be better at the weight than Usyk. Usyk made his debut at heavyweight back in October with a TKO win over Chaz Witherspoon, but Usyk was far from impressive in the fight. He's currently scheduled to face his second heavyweight opponent, the always dangerous Derek Chisora, in the coming months. Like Evander Holofield, he has the speed of a cruiserweight. His speed and quickness will be the difference against heavyweights, the same as Oleksandr Usyk. But will Usyk have the strength to handle heavyweights? He doesn't have a big punch. In the heavyweight division, you need to have something that keeps people back. Sanchez is so confident in Gassiev's ability at heavyweight, he's willing to match him tough against seasoned contenders. However, he would like him to take a tune-up in his first bout back to shake off the rust. Gassiev has been out of the ring for nearly two years. I would like to fight Adam Kovnowski, Robert Hellenius, or Andy Ruiz, but he hasn't fought in two years, so I would like to take a tune-up first, Sanchez said. You know, we've talked about Murat Gassiev's ascent to the heavyweight division a few times now here on the channel and how his particular properties, his characteristics as a fighter, make him very interesting now that he's going to be campaigning in the heavyweight division. He showed quite the beard as a cruiserweight, and he definitely packed a punch, Big punch. as a cruiserweight. He did. But how would those same characteristics fare in the heavyweight division? You'll excuse me for saying so. But I don't think that Abel Sanchez yes, is yes. off his rocker here when he suggests that while Usyk may have gotten the best of Gassiev in their fight, at heavyweight, Gassiev is actually more adequately suited to campaign there. That Usyk's speed, agility, mobility, quickness might have been enough for him to get the best of Gassiev at cruiserweight in the heavyweight division. It's a different story. Abel Sanchez isn't wrong when he says that in the heavyweight division you need something to keep the other guy back and there are very big question marks hovering over Usyk's head as to whether or not he's going to pack the necessary punch to get the other guy's respect now that he's campaigning as a heavyweight because he wasn't the biggest puncher at cruiserweight so he certainly won't be the biggest puncher at heavyweight. Gassiev, however, is a different kettle of fish. He was a very destructive puncher in the cruiserweight division. And it's not far-fetched to say that perhaps that punch will carry to heavyweight. Heavyweight, which is a more comfortable weight for Murat Gassiev to make. He might arrive at heavyweight a lot more energized, a lot more invigorated than he was back when he was making Cruiser. He was killing himself to make Cruiser, at least according to Abel Sanchez. So what happens once Gassiev is playing with a full deck, when his performance isn't Stifled. marginally compromised as a result of trying to make Cruiser? What kind of fight did he get? I Essentially, I don't think that Abel Sanchez is off the mark here. There might actually be something to what he's suggesting that Perhaps, maybe, just maybe, Gassiev's characteristics as a fighter make him a tad bit more adequately suited to campaign as a heavyweight than Usyk's characteristics as a fighter, even though Usyk beat Gassiev. Cruiserweight. Okay. This ain't cruiserweight. It's not. This is heavyweight. This is the heavyweight division, and that is a different kettle of fish entirely. You think about the names that Abel Sanchez mentioned. Adam Kovnowski, Robert Hellenius, Andy Ruiz as potential opponent options for Murat Gassiev. All very interesting matches, some of which I think are winnable fights for Murat Gassiev, in spite of him having not debuted as a heavyweight yet. You know that Adam Kovnowski's coming off that loss to Robert Hellenius. And let's be honest, folks, nobody was expecting that to happen. You're supposed to win that fight. You're an undefeated contender who just cracked the top 10 rank standings for the division. You're expected to be able to beat the likes of a Robert Hellenius and we all know things didn't go to plan for Adam. One can make the inference that, you know what? If Robert Hellenius can get to you at this point in his career where he's widely regarded as a journeyman of sorts, 
It's not far-fetched to say that a Murat Gassiev might get to you also. Murat was a very big puncher in the cruiserweight division, and it's not far-fetched to say that that punch might actually carry into the heavyweight division. Granted that Murat doesn't have the statuesque frame of a Robert Hellenius. But he still stands a fighting chance. Given Adam Kovnowski's implementation, the fact that he's a volume puncher, he's not afraid to let his hands go. A guy like that, whilst having his virtues, is also the same kind of guy that you can catch between the punches as he's opening up. And if Murat lands one of those big hooks on Adam, who knows? Maybe he also could get Adam out of there, because apparently Adam's losing fights, but he's supposed to be able to win. I think something very similar is true in the case of Gassiev versus Hellenius. You know, Hellenius is actually a pretty decent-sized puncher, big frame, guy with a good set of legs, knows how to stick and move. Somewhat. Use his boxing. But this is the same guy that was stopped by Johan Duapas, and this is the same guy who very recently was stopped by Gerald Washington. Gerald Washington is hardly one of the division's bigger punchers, but he was able to get Robert out of there. If Gassiev's punch carries into the heavyweight division, there is a chance he could do the same as, if not better than, a Gerald Washington. Or uh, granted that Gerald and Murat, they have very different physical dimensions and they have very different implementation. But the basic idea here is that if Gerald actually packs enough punch that he could hurt Robert and get him out of there, it's not at all far-fetched to say that Murat might pack the same as, if not a bigger, better punch. It's possible. And Gerald does. The name of former unified heavyweight champion Andy Ruiz was mentioned, and I think that's a taller order than the aforementioned two fighters we just discussed, than either Adam or Robert. I think that Andy's got a better beard than those two guys. Mid-range to inside, Andy Ruiz is lethal. He's not just a strong puncher, he's a very educated counterpuncher. It just so happens that Murat Gassiev and Andy Ruiz have the same sweet spot. That's mid-range to inside in the pocket here today. I don't know that Murat Gassiev is ready for a fight like that against a guy who not only can take a punch, but packs one as well and can hit you with shots that you don't see coming. Pump the brakes. Not that it matters. I don't see Murat Gassiev actually landing an Andy Ruiz fight. I mean, if both Delian White and Luis Ortiz couldn't get Andy to commit to fighting them, fat chance of Andy committing to fighting Murat. What resonates with me the most in reference to these potential matchups and the proposition of Gassiev perhaps being even more formidable at heavyweight than the likes of an Alexander Usyk is, he needs to hurry up and get there. We talked about this in a previous video. I'll leave the link to that video in the description box. Gassiev is a very interesting character, but the time for talk is over. I really want to see this guy debut in the heavyweight division sometime in the near future. This shit is taking forever. Former heavyweight world champion Deontay the Bronze Bomber Wilder, as he has informed me that he did indeed find out that somebody in his team has sacrificed and put something in his water. You heard me. He had somebody in the team sacrificed and put something in his water and spiked his water. There is a prevalent rumor swirling in the boxing community, especially the YouTube boxing community, where the standard for proof, the standard for evidence, the standard for actual sources is tenuous at best. These motherfuckers will say anything. They will. They will say most anything and everything they can to drum up business for their respective channels. Even when what they're saying Bullshit. is completely made up. There are rumors swirling that suggest Deontay Wilder's bottle of water was spiked by a member of his own team. According to these rumors, evidence exists that corroborates this rumor. Oh, really? The problem with all of this is no major news sources are reporting this and we don't see any action, legal action, being taken by Deontay Wilder in reference to this rumor. That if someone spiked your water, if someone drugged you, put something in your water that inhibited your ability to perform. It's classified as an assault. And in some states, an individual can be found guilty of felony battery for drugging someone, which is the allegation here that a member of Deontay Wilder Wilder's own team drugged him, and that's why he lost to Tyson Fury. No. It's not because Deontay Wilder is basically a one-handed fighter who's been relying solely on his power to win these boxing matches to finish them. It's not because he's the same guy who said 
He doesn't need skill because he has power. It's because he was drugged. It's because he was drugged. It's because Tyson Fury was tampering with his gloves and there were metal objects inside of them. Give me a break. And these are uh, YouTube authors, these content creators. They got proof. They allege they have evidence of this, that evidence exists that not only was Deontay Wilder drugged, which is a felony in and of itself, but that Tyson Fury had metal objects inside of his gloves that he somehow got past the Nevada State Athletic Commission. Okay, so what legal action is being taken? As it stands, I've heard no news of Deontay Wilder's team or his team of lawyers filing suit against Tyson Fury or Top Rank for what looks to be attempted homicide. Because not only are you guys saying that somebody drugged this guy, but you're saying that Tyson Fury went into this fight with metal objects inside of his gloves. I mean, this is criminal activity. This goes well beyond the parameters of a boxing match or a sanctioning body, a commission that licenses fighters to fight. What you guys are describing here is basically criminal activity. And if proof exists of this criminal activity, what action is being taken by Deontay Wilder and his team of lawyers in reference to it? Of course, I'll tell you something. Back when Alexander Povetkin tested positive for meldonium ahead of what was to be his fight with Deontay Wilder, didn't take Deontay Wilder or his team very long to conjure up the lawyers. Remember? They lawyered up pretty fucking fast. But you guys, you expect me to believe that you have evidence of all of this. You have proof that a member of Wilder's team spiked his punch, and not only that a member of Wilder's team spiked his punch, but that Tyson Fury went into that fight with metal objects inside of his gloves. You guys, you, you, you Perry Masons. Matt Murdock. You have the proof of this. Okay. Well, if you got proof and this evidence exists, then why isn't Deontay Wilder filing a class action lawsuit not only against Tyson Fury and Top Rank, but the Nevada State Athletic Commission? What? What? He conjures up the lawyers for Alexander Povetkin, but he doesn't conjure up the lawyers for Tyson Fury? Make it make sense. What you guys are describing ain't your run-of-the-mill situation in the sport of boxing. What you guys are describing is premeditated murder. So basically what this is, premeditated murder. And the plan seems to be to allow Deontay Wilder Get this. to fight this individual who allegedly had metal objects inside of his gloves for a third time. <laughs> you lawyer up for Quebec and over Meldonium, but you don't lawyer up for Fury when it comes to metal objects being inside of his gloves. This is fucking stupid. You know, I'm always hearing from these same guys, these same uh, news sources, about Al Heyman's power and influence in the sport of boxing, how he's this fucking genius. And this is the best that Al could come up with. Hey, Wilder, I'll tell you what. I know you were drugged in your last fight, and I know that Tyson Fury had metal objects inside of his gloves, but here's what we're gonna do for you. Instead of filing a class action lawsuit for attempted murder, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you fight that same guy for a third time. Okay. How do you like that? You like that? Yeah, that makes a lot of fucking sense, right? Right. Let me tell you something. This is just another instance of what I've been telling you all along. These guys will say almost anything to drum up business. These guys are YouTube's equivalent of The Sun in the United Kingdom or the National Enquirer in the United States. These are boxing's equivalent of the tabloid rags you pass by on the way to check out your groceries at the local Walmart. That's what this is. These are profiteers of misinformation. That is their racket. Uh, Clickbait. This isn't going to get off the ground. Of course it's not going to get off the ground. But the purpose of these kinds of stories isn't shedding light on what needs to be discussed, exposing the truth. That's not the focal point of what these guys are doing by any stretch of the imagination. What they're trying to do is draw you in with sensationalist headlines based on fabrications in order to drum up business. By the time you watch any one of these kinds of videos and realize that not a shred of evidence is presented anywhere in these videos, these guys have already made their money. They've already lured you in. Whether it's by way of sensationalist headlines or by the sheer ridiculousness of what's being said. One way or another, all they want you to do is watch. Once you do, these individuals have profiteered off of this misinformation. Pretty much. Because if any of this were true, surely Deontay Wilder could find someone to tell. Someone better. Than a couple of YouTube authors. I mean, what's telling a YouTube author about this gonna do? If you really want to do something about it, you call up your lawyer. One would think.
the reality of things is far more mundane. And these individuals will do anything to drum up business. Will do anything for any kind of recognition as this is their racket. Their livelihood. Whether it's by way of stirring up controversies based on false information, spreading falsehoods, or by way of stirring up conflict within the community, within the YouTube boxing community, from one content creator to another. Some people will do anything to get famous. Some people will say anything to make a profit. In truth, all these stories these guys are conjuring up. None of it's gonna help Deontay Wilder once he's gotta climb in the ring with Tyson Fury for a third time, but maybe, just maybe, they're not trying to help Deontay Wilder. They know this, and what they're actually trying to do is salvage what they can from what is a sinking ship. This has been a hot topic for a while now. They're making what money they can while they still can. This is a wave that they've been riding for some time now, but like all waves, this one is set to crash. These individuals will be forced to move on to the next one, whatever that might be. These kinds of clickbait stories are not intended to expose or shed light on anything. They're intended to get me and you to click them. Cause how fucking stupid would you have to be to believe any of this stuff? Think about it. Think about it. Use your fucking head for a change. Deontay Wilder was fighting a guy who had metal objects inside of his gloves at a time when he's been poisoned. Yet that same Deontay Wilder is about to lock horns with that same guy for a third time. Instead of calling his lawyer? Okay.